Hello, thank you for coming to my webinar. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about accessibility um, and it's not just about screen readers, but before we get into that, just um, a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, so this is me. Um, I'm Gemma Nunn, obviously. Um, I am a senior content developer with Mint Interactive. Um, I've been working with Mint for about nine months now. Um, but before that, I have been a web designer and developer. I've been a lecturer and um, I've been an e-learning developer and consultant. Um, I've been working in education and design for about 20-ish years. Um, and my master's degree is actually in uh, digital technologies, communication and education. Um, so for the uninitiated, basically, e-learning so I'm quite knowledgeable on the realms of e-learning um, when I'm not working um, <laughs> just sharing a little bit of my uh, outside work life uh, when I'm not working I'm usually in a field pretending to be a fantasy character or I'm sitting around a table with a like, lot of dice playing Dungeons and Dragons um, more of my uh, role-playing antics later but it is relevant I promise so let's get into the meat of the piece shall we so before we start um i'm going to pose a little question to everybody how important do you consider accessibility to be when you're designing a course um and uh we should hopefully have a little poll question popping up and i just want you to rate there we go just want you to rate how important you think it is, um, ranging from very important to very unimportant. So just give you all a, a minute or two just to pass in your votes and then we'll talk about it. And when uh, we've got some uh, responses, we'll have a look on the polls bit and see what the results are. That says 100%, Gemma, everybody's answered. Fantastic, right. Let's have a look at the results. Excellent. So everybody who is currently voted, um, and it's, uh, that's brilliant. You think it's very important and quite rightly so. Um, and this is where we're going to get into with the uh, next uh, slide. So let's just move on. So why is it important? And I'm very glad that all of you have responded that this is that, that this is very important. Um, when we look at um, the statistics and then the related legislation, which I've got here up on my slide, accessibility is a huge topic especially at the moment. And unfortunately, there is absolutely no chance I can tell you everything you need to know about it in one session. There's just too much of it to go through. But what I am aiming to do by the end of the session is to pass on some of the best practices that we've adopted at Mint and to get you thinking about accessibility as part of um, the learning design process and not think of it as an afterthought because unfortunately that seems to be the way that things are going with a lot of people who are working in our industry. So back to the lovely statistics on the board. Uh, so we have over 16 million people in the UK with long-term illnesses, impairments or disabilities. So um, it's really important that we are thinking about these people when we're designing our learning and not just when we're designing e-learning, when we're designing any kind of web-based interaction or mobile interaction. Um, as part of the Equality Act 2010, all UK service providers must provide, must consider reasonable adjustments for disabled people. Now, at a glance, some people think, oh, well, is this just for making um, adjustments in the workplace, you know, making it, making it, it people able to um, have access to wheelchairs, have correct, correct equipment and stuff like that. It's not just that. We also need to think about how they're accessing um, information online, including their learning. 
So if we've got a lot of training programs that are being put online for workers to access in order for them to train and further their careers um, or to just basically do their job, we need to make sure that that learning is accessible. Um, this is also covered under the UK sector bodies, which is websites and mobile applications, the accessibility regulations of 2018. Um, we need to make sure that websites and mobile applications are perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. And those four words are very important because they are the principles on which accessibility is based. So we'll, we'll come to that a little bit later on. Now, just to give you an example of how important accessibility is and why it's something that we in our industry definitely need to start thinking about um, in a more serious capacity. Um, earlier this year, in March, um, a blind man who was, um, who was employed by uh, Western Trust received a £3,000 payout because a job opportunity that was available on their internal website could not be used. He could not access it. He, he could not um, correctly get through the, um, the fields. He couldn't enter the information. His screen reader just wasn't working with this application. And that denied this man the opportunity to apply for a job. Now, this relates to our industry because we are by not making our stuff accessible, there is a possibility that we could deny somebody the potential to develop in their career, advance to another job opportunity, that sort of thing. And this is something that is going to have to be embedded into what we do on a daily basis. And it needs to become part of the design process, not the, oh, can we just add accessibility and it's it's not a long-term solution we need to start thinking about this from the beginning so there are four major disability types hearing sight motor and cognitive and just to give you a few examples um, hearing this can be from mild hearing loss to deafness um, you could also be in a very noisy environment you could be on a work site. You could be somewhere where there's just a lot of noise going on. You could even be um, sitting at a bus station or an airport and you can't quite hear what's going on. Um, you might be watching it on your phone. So that, that would be counting as part of the hearing um, type. Sight, low vision, blindness, colour blindness, those sorts of things. Um, speaking from my own experience, I am very, very, very short sighted. In fact, if I were to take my glasses off right now, I can't actually read what's going on on my screen. It's all extremely blurry. Um, so it, it's an accessibility issue for me if I were to say, for example, lose my glasses, which I have a habit of doing. Um, there's also motor which refers to partial and full paralysis, uh, hand tremors, lack of sensitivity, coordination, dexterity issues, and then with, and of course, broken or amputated limbs. Um, these are all things that can happen. Um, a person can break their arm and not be able to use uh, the dominant hand to operate a keyboard, so they might not be able to do their job or they may not be able to access their learning. So what we need to make sure is that we put things in place to cater for as many of these accessibility issues as we can. It sounds pretty daunting. And yeah, I'm not going to lie. When I first started looking into accessibility, I panicked a little bit. But once you get over the, the first sort of hurdle and the first sort of panic block, you will have an aha moment and it will start to make sense because a lot of it is just putting yourself into a person's shoes and thinking about, well, how would they access this? How would they access that? And working through it logically. And this is where the role play aspect comes into it. So on to the next slide. So I have said that this is not just about screen readers. Um, it's not. Screen readers, however, are a very, very useful bit of technology. It means that, you know, people who are blind 
can have the screens read to them. People who are dyslexic can utilize the tool as well. There are lots of other different ways in which screen readers can be used, but they are not the only assistive technology that is available. Um, you've got, we, in our industry, we do have a tendency to hyper focus on screen readers, but there are other things out there such as Braille readers. Um, these are devices that receive text from a specialized software and it converts it into Braille and it displays um, by using uh, pounded pins through a flat surface. So a person who would who is blind or uses Braille um, Braille reader can actually read the web page using Braille. It's it's a pretty cool bit of kit actually. Um, we've got other things like screen magnification and voice recognition. Um, screen mag magnification is something um, which me personally, I would find very useful if I were, for example, to have put my glasses somewhere, usually on my head, and completely forgotten that they're there. It happens quite a lot. And um, I could use screen magnification to zoom in and I can actually see the words on the screen. There won't be just a massive blur. Um, voice recognition um, is quite a useful product and um, people can control computers using their voice and of course we've seen this technology quite a lot with obviously um, Alexa, Siri, that sort of thing. Um, people can also use it to um, leave voice messages or do speech to text so there's quite a lot of really cool bits of technology out there which are making IT and well learning and any IT based systems quite accessible. Now, in my experience, I've worked with a lot of clients who think that adding a text-based version of a piece of interactive learning is all that's required to make it accessible. It is a viable solution in some circumstances. However, in my personal opinion, I think it's a cop-out. It's just lazy design. Why should a learner be denied with a, a type of disability or impairment be denied the same experience that other learners have that's not inclusive design that's kind of singling them out and say oh well you can't use this or here's have the text version that's not on you know it's not it's lazy design as I said what we need to do as designers is we need to see this as a challenge and Think of ways in which we can make it learning solutions that cater to everybody and not just use a cop-out text-only version. So I'm just going to bring up this quote by uh, the father of the World Wide Web, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And um, I think it's quite relevant to the message I'm, get, I'm, I'm hoping to get across today is that the power of the web is in its universe, universality. I can't say that word. <laughs> Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. And that's really the key sentence here. So this is something that we need to think about as e-learning designers, web designers, web developers. The thing about accessibility is that it benefits everyone. And I have touched upon this already um, in previous uh, screens. What I've got on here is a, quite a, a cool little graphic, which was produced by Microsoft, labeled inclusive design. And what we've got on here is we've got some examples of different types of disability. So we've got permanent, temporary and situational. And we've got touch, see, hear and speak, which are uh, referencing to the, the different, well, the major types of disability that we've already discussed. So just to give you a few examples of how making something accessible benefits everybody. Let's say you're out in the field and you've got a really poor internet connection or you're stopping in a hotel and you get 30 minutes of rubbish Wi-Fi for free and then you've got to pay an exorbitant amount of money to um, get a Wi-Fi for the rest of the evening. Having taken accessibility into account to make sure that um, 
you've got videos that you can either read a transcript of or you've got limited, you know, alternatives for things that would take up a lot of bandwidth or would be really slow to download. That's benefiting you when you're in that situation. It is a situation. It's a situational um, disability, as it were, but it's still very handy. But it also benefits people. Say, for example, you've got a really rubbish internet connection at home, but and you need to watch this video, but you can't because you just can't download it, but you can read the transcript. Or there are other alternatives you can look at, which will help explain a process. You've also got things to think about. It's like your devices. Lots of people are accessing um, and working either on mobile phones, they're working on tablets, or they're working on computers and laptops. So we need to think about that, um, those range of devices to design for and think about the situations that people might find themselves in. We also need to think about our aging population. Um, there are a lot of older people now who are using um, tablets, mobile phones, computers, etc. Um, but as they're getting older, their situations and abilities may be changing due to their aging. Um, so as I discussed earlier, um, when we were talking about um, motor-based impairments and disabilities, thinking about hand tremors, sensitivity, movement, that sort of thing, because you've got sort of a, um, you, aging illnesses uh, linked to arthritis, Parkinson's, that sort of thing. So lots of things to think about we also need to think about you know socially ex inclusive which also links back to the internet connections and bandwidth and that sort of thing and there's also the language barriers you may find especially with e-learning being on such a global scale now um, the world has gotten extremely small especially since the pandemic and we are communicating and doing business with people globally more now than ever before we need to think about language barriers where English is not necessarily going to be a person's first language. So we need to think about how we word things, how we make our language simple to understand, particularly on a general scope. When it comes to more specialised learning, um, particularly something, say, for example, advanced engineering principles or um, uh, medical uh situations these might be um, areas where you will have more specialized language but in general we want to think about simplifying the language and making it easy to understand and this is part of the part parcel of the job of being an instructional designer okay so I want to stop talking for a second so I have another question to pose to you all um, so based on what we've just what I've just talked about for the past few minutes, um, how confident do you feel when applying accessibility to your course designs? Um, so just bring the poll up there and I'll give you a couple of minutes to just think about this question and then we'll have a look at the uh, responses and then we'll just talk about it a little bit. So this is how you feel now, right this second, how feel how confident do you feel right now? Because I'm hoping, because I'm going to pose this question to you again at the end of the session, I'm hoping that your answer will change. Hopefully for the better. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at the results. Okay, so we've got majority of you are feeling somewhat confident and some of you are not feeling confident at all. And that is totally fair. Accessibility is a massive topic. There is so much of it to, to learn and understand. And I'll be honest with you, I'm still learning. Um, I'm still finding out new things and new techniques and stuff like that but the best way to learn about accessibility is to do it is to think about it to read about it and to do it so 
that's why you're here in this webinar. So I am going to be sharing some of that wisdom in a second. So what should we be doing? We need to learn about our learners. This is a step often missed. I've done it in the past. I am guilty of this. It's something that where we're, I'm working on being better at, but we need to learn about our learners. We need to find out as much as we can about these people. Often we get a, a course come in. Can you build this course? Okay, who's it for? Oh, it's just for our learners. Who are these people? What, do, what are their needs? What are their expectations? What are their limitations? Put yourself in your learner's shoes. And this is, again, where my whole experience being a, a role player comes in. How do you feel? Are you frustrated? Would you be frustrated if you can't access something? Is it difficult to control or use an interaction? Is there enough information to help you navigate a page? Is there too much information? Is there a lot of repetition through alt tags and ARIA labels? More on that later. Putting yourself in the shoes of your learners, learning about them, doing learner user stories. Yes, it might seem like a little bit of an extra bit of work, but it's so important when you're trying to design an accessible learning experience. Accessibility should not be an afterthought. I've mentioned this already. I'm probably going to mention it again, but this is a, a really important point. A lot of times I have, I've had experience with um, people coming to me um, at the end of a project saying, oh, we need to make this accessible. Okay, how do we need to make this accessible? What do we need to include? And often, more often than not, we have to go back and, and rework a lot of the course. So it actually takes us more time to make a course access to, accessible after the fact than to plan that accessibility before we actually build. So just going back to the step about learning about our learners, we, we should spend that time learning about our learners because it will actually save us time later. So accessibility definitely should not be an afterthought. It needs to come within the design phase, during the storyboard phase, before you even start building a course or building any kind of learning interaction. Finally, educating our colleagues and clients. And this is what we're doing right now. Um, we are sharing our ideas. We are talking about it. And this is a topic that's going to be talked about a lot in the coming months. Accessibility is, bec is becoming a very major part of what we do as learning developers, learning designers. And the best way that we can do this is we can educate ourselves, we can and then talk about it with our colleagues, and we can educate our clients. This is the best way that we can start making sure that accessibility is not an afterthought. And the way that we make accessibility not an afterthought is that we learn about our learners. So I'm hoping you can see that these three main points are very interconnected. So I'm sure you're all sat there thinking, geez, that's lots of stuff I need to think about. How am I ever going to do it all? Well, this part of the uh, webinar is very much geared towards quick wins. So we're going to have a look at three things that you can put into your learning right now that will help make it more accessible. So we're going to talk about headings and hierarchies, alt tags and ARIA labels, and plain language and readable text. So, so I've got a couple of graphics that I'm going to flash up on the screen here. When we're talking about headings and hierarchies, we need to think about how we're presenting our content. So what I've got it, um, on the screen is an example of a good, uh, a good hierarchy and bad hierarchy. We need to use headings um, in a structured way rather than, oh, it looks good. We need to get away from the idea that headings are just to make things look aesthetically pleasing. It's all about how we structure a document. If we structure a document correctly, it's a lot easier for um, not just people with screen readers, but people um, with cognitive impairments or disabilities to follow along with the content. 
it benefits everybody, as I've said previously. Now, in the bad hierarchy, what we've got is just a simple example of how to design an e-learning course. And then you've got some headings underneath that and then some subheadings underneath that. Now, you'll notice that I've included um, H1, H2 and H3. These are HTML tags. Um, if you are building a course purely in HTML, you'll be very familiar with this. But, but for those of you who are relying on software such as Rise, Storyline, um, Evolve, etc., these will be automatically built in and will be part of the software. The reason I'm putting them on here is, is that they do correlate between the software and the outcome that you publish. Um, just to make you aware. And if you do get curious, have a look at the software that you're using and see and see if you can identify where these H1 tags, these H2 tags and H3 tags come into it. In RISE, for example, the H1 tends to be the big banner at the top of the screen. And then the H2 is like your heading and your H3 is your subheadings. In Evolve, it's pretty similar. In Storyline, it's pretty similar. But anyway, when you are organizing content of a course, and this is something that you should be doing from your storyboarding phase, is think about putting the course and putting the content into chunks. So you've got your overall heading at the top, which in this example is how to design an e-learning course. And then it's divided up into subsections, analyzing a course, designing the course, evaluating the course. And then within those subsections, we've got identifying training needs, who are the learners, accessibility con considerations. In that example, those three are related to the analyze the content. In the design the course, order of content, how it will be presented, identify assessment methods, they are related to design of the course. So you can start to see there how we can group these topics together in a certain way. And um, this is an old um, instructional design term, but um, we can chunk it out. And this is what we need to be doing. So we need to look at the content first, divide it into correct headings and hierarchy. And then when we transfer it into the online platform that we're using, we can have a much easier time of making this um, hierarchy and headings accessible and easy for people to follow. So that's all I'm going to say about headings and hierarchies because I could go more into it, but we'll be here all day. So the next one is talking about alt tags. Now, this is probably the most commonly um, thought about accessibility um, item, and a lot of people will already be aware of this. It's a thing. Um, what a lot of people are not aware of is how to write alt tags properly. Now, when it comes to images, images are broken down into four different types. We've got informative images, which represent concepts and information. Decorative, they're purely aesthetic or ornamental. Uh, functional, so we're talking now about your buttons, your icons, image links, that sort of thing. And then, we'll talk, and then we've got complex images, such as graphs and diagrams. So I've got an example here for you all to look at. And just to have a couple of seconds in the chat, how would you, what would you define this image as? Just purely out of interest, how would you, if you stick your answers in the chat, how would you define this image as an alt tag? Yeah, Jane says decorative. Yeah. And Jane, you would be right. You would be absolutely right. Uh, Liz says, uh, would it depend on why the image has been included? Yes, it would. Fiona, you said decorative as well. The thing is, is that you're right. It could be, it really depends on the context in which you use in the image. Now, in this example, it's purely decorative. It has absolutely nothing to do with the content that's shown on the left-hand side of the screen. If it was um, 
something like a, a graph or um, something a bit more complex that actually related to the content, it would be an informative or complex image. But at the minute, it's just purely decorative. So if I was going to write this as an alt tag, there's two ways I could do this for a decorative image. I could make it a null alt tag, which means essentially putting nothing in there. And then what happens is a screen reader or an assistive technology just completely ignores it because it's just there for decoration. It doesn't add anything to the context. It's just purely there for decoration. On the other hand, if I had, say, a block of e-learning and I had a graph or a diagram to that would associate with that block of text, it could be classed as informative because it represents a concept or information. If it's a graph or a diagram, this is where we start getting into a complex um, graphic. So for this one, what we've got is we've got a graph uh, showing all of the film ratings for the Star Wars films. Um, and if I was to write this as an alt tag, what I've got underneath is an example, a graph showing that the highest rated Star Wars film is episode four, A New Hope, which every no one knows is wrong because episode five, The Empire Strikes Back is better. That's my personal opinion, massive Star Wars nerd. But when you've got images like this, they can be quite daunting because trying to describe this to somebody using an alt tag can be quite, it's a lot of information to try and sum up in a single sentence. So what we tend to do with these complex images is that we will write a short overview alt tag, such as the one that we've got on the screen. And we then include what we call a long description. Now, this might be um, a longer paragraph of text, which you might hide under an accordion if you're using software such as Rise and Evolve. Or you can have a link to another page which gives a lot more uh, or a pop up which gives a lot more of a detailed explanation of the um, chart or diagram. It really depends on you on you as a designer of how you want to do this. But my advice to you would be um, for images that are alongside a piece of text that provides concept like represent concepts and information, you can write a very short alt tag. If it's purely decorative, it adds nothing to the context. It's or it's aesthetic. It's ornamental. Use what we call a null tag, a null alt tag, which is basically just a space. Um, it depends on which software you're using. Some software is better than others for um, creating null tags. But if you are co coding this in HTML, it is basically just putting a space in there. Um, but I would imagine that quite a few of you aren't doing that, and you're using software. Uh, functional, this depends on, uh, this is usually related to buttons, icons and image links. So if you've got an icon, say, for example, uh, an icon of a printer button, it doesn't have any um, image text to go with it. It's just purely a, a, a printer button. You would put an alt tag on there, giving the instruction saying, click, uh, select this button to print your work. What I would recommend in those cases is maybe put a little bit of extra text on there just to add some, uh, just to give a little bit of additional context. But again, it really comes down to your judgment as a designer of how you do that. And as I've already said, with complex graphs and diagrams, um, an overall explanation in the alt tag, and then you might want to include a longer description, depending on how much detail you want to go into. There is a load of stuff online available, which I'll point you to at the end of the session, um, which will give you a lot more information on different nuances of how to write alt tags. We'll just move on. I'm only going to briefly go over ARIA labels because these in of, in of themselves are an entire webinar. They could be an entire session, but they are essentially, um, ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and these are related to a lot to the backend code, a lot of the backend HTML code. You will find ARIA labels referred to in some um, e-learning software. Evolve definitely makes a big use of it. Um, 
And the idea behind these is they are used in conjunction with assistive technologies to help users better understand and interact with content. So, um, for example, in Evolve, one of the things that we tend to do is when we are working with an interaction, we will use the ARIA labels fields um, to provide more information for users who are using assistive technologies to just kind of give them additional instructions to help them to understand what to expect with the interaction and that sort of thing. The key thing I would like is to take away from writing alt tags and ARIA labels is that it is something that takes a lot of practice. Um, the more you do it, the better you become at it. And I would highly recommend having a look at some of the fantastic resources that are available on the WCAG website. There are so many different articles and tutorials and different uh, circumstances in which they talk about how to write good old tags. But as I say, I will make reference to them at the end of the presentation. Okay, so more nerdiness from yours truly. Um, plain language and readable text. Now, this is um, one of my favorite quotes. Um, it is from Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm disinclined to acquiesce to your request. Means no. The point I'm making here is, is that we want to use plain and readable text for our learners. Would people with cognitive difficulties find the first sentence of this quote difficult to read? Would somebody who, who for English isn't their first language, would they find that difficult to read? And I would say, quite likely, why use lots and lots of words when you could just use a simple phrase? That's the main point that I'm trying to make here. When you're doing industry-based or industry-specific explanations that use specific, like use specialized terminology and jargon and they play a role, that's absolutely fine as long as you explain it, especially with acronyms. One of my pet peeves when I'm designing is when an SME gives me a piece of content with loads of acronyms and doesn't explain them. If they are trying to educate somebody and provide them with training, we need to give them acronyms. We need to explain them. So this would come in as part of them making it easy to understand, readable. But as I've already said earlier, we need to keep the, um, the text quite simple and readable unless we are using industry specific terminology. Now, readable text, this is not just about the actual language we're using, we're talking about space in our text out. Now, if you have a look at the differences between these two items here, it's the exact same text, but it's laid out differently. One is easier to read than the other. The one on the left, it's all crowded together. It's quite a small font. There's not a great deal of space into it. And that can be quite intimidating um, to people, um, especially those with dyslexia, quite intimidating to read. And also for somebody like me who is really, really short-sighted, if I had forgotten my glasses, there would be no way I could read it. On the, le on the right, we've got, it's a bit more spaced out. We're using a larger font. We've got the key elements broken down. We've got more space in between the lines. So if these are things that you've got control over within the software or platform in which you're building your learning, use it. It will make so much, it will make a massive difference to your learners. It'll be easier to read. It'll be easier to absorb. And with the broken down in chunks like this, it'll be easy for them to remember. So it's not just about making accessible. It's also helping with retention of information. Just as an example. Now, what I would say with regards to text and text sizes and font sizes and using different fonts when you're designing a learning in any or, or any learning for that matter, is um, 
line spacing and font size are really, really important. So um, I would recommend that you stick with um, accessibility friendly fonts such as Arial, uh, Calibri, Vidana, Tahoma. Um, a minimum font size you want to be using would be 16 pixels. Um, that's a good size for body text. Um, however, just bear in mind, um, different fonts have different properties. So that might mean that 16 pixels might be too big or too small, depending on the font. So you need to experiment. You need to try different things out to see if it works. And obviously to make sure that it is in fact readable. The other thing you need to be aware of, um, and this is me delving again into the, the realms of web development, but it is a good bit of information to know. Pixels, um, we use pixels rather than points when designing for the web. Uh, points tends to be majority uh, related to print-based media. Um, obviously we see it quite a lot in Microsoft Word. Um, Pixels and points are both known as absolute units of measurement, um, which means that it's quite difficult for them to scale um, in size, um, depending on the screen. And that can have an adverse effect on um, screen mag magnification software. Wherever possible, we should be using units of measurements called M's or REMs. Uh, these are scalable and they are much better for enlarging text sizes and screen magnification. Now, unfortunately, I know that this is a limitation in a lot of um, e-learning software that's available, um, but uh, we are th th there are people who are campaigning to say, please make M's and REMs a thing because it really does help with screen magnification. Uh, pixels and points, as I say, do a job to a certain degree, but not as well as M's and REMs could. So uh, that's just something a bit to bear in mind. Okay, how are we doing for time, Paula? Uh, we've got 15 minutes left, Gemma. Cool, well, I am getting close to the end, so we will have time for some questions. Okay, so just going back to um, the question that I posed to you before I started talking at length, um, let's just revisit this. Uh, how confident do you feel when applying accessibility to course designs? I'm hoping that some of the tips that I've shared with you might give you a little bit more confidence of things to at least try out um, and things to think about when you come to do um, accessibility and thinking about accessibility within your course designs. Um, so even if I can get you to step up one level, that would be my job done. Um, and if you've stepped down one level, then, oh dear. Um, <laughs> somewhat embarrassing for yours truly, but hey ho. So say how people are doing on the poll in a moment. Yay, we've got some people who've jumped up a level. That is amazing. That is really good. I hope that's, I really, really hope that some of the tips that I've shared with you have helped. Um, and as I say, hopefully we'll have a, a, couple of, a few, couple of minutes left over for questions at the end. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. There we go. So we have barely scratched the surface of this. Um, accessibility, there is a lot to it there's just so much to learn but what I've got here is some places for you to start I've already mentioned the WCAG guidelines um, you can search for them online if you type in WCAG guidelines into any browser search um, you'll be able to come you'll be able to find the website immediately and this is basically the bible for accessibility or digital accessibility at the very least and it will give you everything you need to know it'll give you the the long the long winded uh, reference guides, but it will also give tutorials and other bits of guidance, which you will find extremely helpful. I know I do. I have this as a open tab on my computer at all times when I'm working. 
Um, W3C and WAI standards. Now, these are the guidelines that build the World Wide Web. Now, this is how we are able to see some of the wonderful things that we see online today. Um, and that does have a lot of very useful information about um, web design, web development, and of course, accessibility. Um, I'm going to give a brief mention to the Ali project. Um, again, if you search for this in your browser search window, um, you will be able to find a lot of information on this really, really cool resource. Again, it's got lots of articles and information that will help you um, as you're learning about accessibility and how to implement it. Uh, WebAIM, again, another extremely useful resource, and they've got a very handy um, bits of uh, browser plugins that will help you assess the accessibility of your course. Online courses, um, I cannot recommend the DEC University enough. Their online e-learning um, courses for accessibility are really, really detailed and they have a lot of really useful information. And if you're thinking about getting into um, accessibility and getting accredited for it, um, the IAAP, which is the International um, Association of Accessibility Practitioners, had to think about that one for a second, that is the main body of accreditation that you might want to go to to um, investigate. Um, alternatively, you can look at um, using specialists to support you, like us. And uh, this is uh, a last question for you. What is your key takeaway from this webinar? And I just want you to put a couple of just little note in the chat and uh, I'll just uh, have a quick chat about them. So just give you a moment to do that. Okay, so so alt tags, sites to uh, tips to sites to visit, and alt tags. Yep, those are. I, I find that those are the ones that once you start getting your head around them, you can really get into accessibility and start understanding more about it um but it's grand that it's it's helping people this has helped people get on sort of the right track and see where they're at with their accessibility stuff okay so just before we get into questions i am going to do a tiny little sales pitch here but i'm only going to i'm going to keep it really brief um so just to tell you a little bit about mint and who we are and what we do um we are a digital design agency. Uh, we do specialize in e-learning, but we do do other things like 3D animation, as you can see on the board there. We are extremely accessibility conscious when we're planning and developing our projects. Um, we are planning to launch an accessibility checking service later this year. It's our aim to assist and educate people about the importance of accessibility and the benefits of inclusive design. Um, so if you would like to know more about that, you can get in touch with us via the following. There we go. Um, you can contact us at hello at mintaractive.com or you can email yours truly. Um, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint slides that I've been using today, please email me and I will forward them on to you. And if you want to give us a follow on uh, LinkedIn, we are on there at mint-interactive. Um, I'm assuming we've only got a few more minutes left for questions, so I'm happy to take them now. Um, ask away. I am happy to listen. I'm happy to help. Yeah, you've, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes for for questions. Um, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, I'll just tell you about some of the events that we've got coming up soon. Um, so we have another webinar tomorrow called, sorry, I'm looking at it on my other screen here. Um, it's Getting Started with AI for Learning, and that's with Robin Scott and Sophie Coston from Make Real. Um, we've also got a summer mixer, it's not a summer mixer, a summer casual coming up in London um, at the start of August as well. 
Um, and of course, we have our Connect conference coming up in November. And I'll post a link to the events page in the chat so that you can check them out as well. Um, after today, we're going to we're going to share the recording. I know that there was a bit of an issue with people not getting the 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 link to join, so we'll be uh, sharing it on our YouTube channel. But we'll post out some um, some posts on LinkedIn and on Twitter when they're available, or if it's still called Twitter, I think it's getting rebranded depending on how Elon feels today. Um, Got one question in on the chat from Emily. Uh, is there a rough estimation example and percentage for how much accessibility requirements add to the word count of a course? Oh, that is a very good question. Uh, one that I don't have an answer to off the top of my head, Emily. So uh, congratulations, you stumped the teacher. <laughs> um, I don't think it adds a super amount. I'm just kind of going off on my own experience here. I don't think it adds a super amount to the word count. Um, it really depends on the content of the course. If you've got, for example, a course that's talking about statistics, let's take that one. That's going to have a lot of complex diagrams and and you know items that are going to require a lot of explanation. So I would imagine that not only would you have to create the alt tags for the um, the actual graphic, but you'd have to include a long description to describe the graphic. So I would say in that sort of circumstance, it would add to um, the word count of a course. But, you know, it's how long is a piece of string? It really depends on the context. Have we got any other questions? Thanks, uh, just some some messages saying great session, thank you. Um, yep, hope to see you at Connect as well, Jane. Brilliant. So I think um, yep, that's that's five two. So um, all that's left to say is thanks so much, Gemma, for a really informative and fascinating session. I think we've all taken away really practical tips that we can put into to practice right away. Um, my name's Paula. I've been your host for the day and thanks very much for joining us. Bye. Bye now.